So, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm really happy to be here this morning. Uh, finally, you know, uh, this paper has been uh, two years, over two years in the making. So hopefully it will make sense uh, at some point. Um, so, uh, yeah. Treasure Island came out in the United States on July 19, 1950. Of course, I'm talking about uh, Walt Disney's very first live action movie, entirely shot in England, uh, not in the Caribbean. Uh, this 1950 feature was directed by Byron Haskin. It had spectacular production values, splendid scenery in Technicolor. The box office receipts were equally spectacular, uh, over $4 million for an initial budget of $1.8 million. Now, uh, the, uh, the Welsh actor Robert Newton's histrionic rendition of Long John Silver popularized the, the West Country accent as a hallmark of big screen, larger than life pirates as of the 1950s. You know, it's an influence felt all the way to Geoffrey Rush as Captain Barbosa in the early 21st century uh, Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Jim Hawkins uh, was played by the American child actor Bobby Driscoll. So you can see both of them in this picture. Uh, Driscoll was 12 when the movie was shot. Uh, his two main claims to fame were his roles as Jim in Treasure Island, but also as uh, the voice and close-up model of Peter Pan uh, in the feature film of 1953. Peter Pan was his last major role before severe acne put a halt to his acting career and added his name to the long list of child actors whose bank, big screen bankability died once they were hit by puberty. Uh, the movie aired on US television in the ABC Network's weekly anthology series, Disneyland, in two parts on uh, January 5 and 12, 1955. So by our present day standards, that TV show was a rather anticlimactic experience. Uh, in, in the mid-50s, the glorious Technicolor film uh, released in theaters five years earlier appeared as a slightly blurry black and white flick shown on a diminutive screen. Yet, for the children of the Crumb household in Oceanside, California, so for those who don't know this uh, wonderful place, it's a seaside town 60 kilometers north of San Diego, uh, for them the viewing of the Walt Disney movie was a momentous event. The Crumbs were a typical 1950s white lower middle class family. So you see them here. The father, Charles, was a former U.S. Marine turned salesman in a latex factory. Uh, the mother, Beatrice, was a neurotic homemaker addicted to dexedrine, uh, the amphetamine drug that at the time used to be widely prescribed by physicians to overweight people. And five children born between 1941 and 1945. Uh, the eldest and youngest siblings, Carol and Sandra, will be only mentioned in passing here. But the three boys, Charles, Robert, Maxon, will be at the center of this story. The second boy, Robert, is someone you may have heard of. is the world-famous underground cartoonist R. Crumb. Uh, you will have heard of his brothers only if you know the 1994 documentary uh, that was uh, directed by his friend Terry Zweigoff. The documentary uh, deals with the human and artistic trajectory of Robert Crumb, an American baby boomer from a very ordinary background who never went to college nor held a steady job after 1967, yet went on to become one of the most influential illustrators of the 60s counterculture. One of the main points addressed in the documentary is how Robert was influenced into becoming a self-taught cartoonist by his older brother, Charles, that you see him here on the left. Um, uh, no, excuse me. No, no, sorry. On the right. Ch Charles on the right. That's Maxon uh, on the left. Uh, Charles was a kid obsessed with comics who literally compelled his younger siblings to share in his obsession. All three crumb boys had issues, but Charles was the one whose life was eventually most impacted by them. Uh, the, ah, yeah. the, the viewing of Walt Disney's Treasure Island on TV was a pivotal experience for the three kids. Crumb's first retelling of it appeared in 1978 as this two-page story. Treasure Island Days, um, so in an uh, underground comic 
uh, one shot underground comic uh, about life in the suburbs from the late 40s to the 60s. In this piece, Crumb recalled how the three brothers' fascination with the Treasure Island movie turned into a protracted role-playing game for Charles. For weeks, he proceeded to dress up as Long John Silver and walk on one leg with a makeshift crutch and invent activities inspired by the movie uh, for the three brothers. But the ending of the story here suggests that uh, Charles gave up the routine after a few weeks after getting into trouble with other kids. Uh, when this comic came out in 78, it was uh, implicitly autobiographical, but years later, as segments of Crumb's life story were laid bare in Terry Zweigoff's documentary, it became clear that Treasure Island Days was much more autofictional than autobiographical, and based on the more complex and unsettling reality in the pasts of the three Crumb boys. The real story, pieced together in the documentary, was subsequently complemented by two texts uh, written by Max and Cram. So here uh, I show you how our Cram presented the genesis of his 1978 comic in the documentary. Um, yeah, so the starting point was the strong impression left on the boys by the Walt Disney Treasure Island. It was not really surprising for um, U.S. Uh, male viewers aged uh, 13, 12, and 11 in the mid-50s. However, the long-term after-effects of the viewing were unforeseen. Shortly after seeing the movie, the youngest boy, Maxon, uh, decided to apply his DIY skills to the making of a crutch, similar to Long John Silver's. So he found a, 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 an old stick in the father's garage, an empty toilet paper roll, and put together a convincing crutch. When he was done, he ran excitedly upstairs to the bedroom where his two older brothers were confabulating when they were not drawing comics. Then the following scene happened, again in Maxon's words, I quote, Leaning my weight on the crutch, I kicked my leg rearward, foot into butt, and hobbled back into the room on one leg. Ha ha, I exclaimed, then nervously with a mouse squeak in it, What be this, mates? I squinted and growled, Yeah, Charles' face expressed, What? My voice had been uh, uncertain and weak. His was like the report of eight shotgun rounds at once. Avast there, George Mary! Be you standing for captain here? By the powers, I'll teach you better. Uh, sorry for my terrible um, um, impression of uh, uh, Robert Newton's uh, West Country accent. Charles grasped the crutch and proceeded with an impression of uh, Long John Silver, of Robert Newton, that left his brothers first speechless, then roaring with laughter. It was the start of a role-playing routine that did not last weeks but years. And uh, to improve his brother's act, Maxson took it upon himself to make more authentic accessories. Uh, crutches, other crutches. Uh, he provided his brother with uh, toy pistols 
And uh, the costume uh, was another DIY masterpiece, I quote, an old green dyed camel hair overcoat of my mother's and a red with white pinstripes straw spring hat stripped of its farm decor and with its white brim pinned up in three places to fashion an 18th century three corner hat. Uh, to complete the illusion, a few adroitly devised stage props, so I quote again, a couple of wood boxes and cheaper crates. On the wood boxes, Charles wrote receiving notices as if sent by a delivery agent from Bristol, England. We even found two or three uh, small wooden kegs in a plowed field somewhere that had wooden spigots on them. Uh, Charles put a promo and logo for Jamaica rum on one. So Charles' play acting was a hit with his two brothers and uh, their young friends as he hobbled around the neighborhood on a crutch, bellowing orders in his ragged old pirate costume. So this is the part of the story that dovetails with Crumb's 1978 comic. Um, the, uh, well, the reality was that the children who were the same age as Robert or younger were thrilled with the oldest brother's antics. But Charles more than once got into troubles with other teens who were uh, not willing to play along into his fantasy. Charles actually went so far as to get his siblings and a few of their younger neighbors entangled in a pitched battle with a gang of local white trash kids who had sticks, bats, toy guns, uh, while Charles, always dressed as a one-legged pirate, kept up a raving banter in West Country lingo. The rest of the story is actually unsettling. I've already said that the eldest crumb boy was obsessed with comics to the point of literally bullying his brother Robert into co-creating with him dozens and dozens of what they called two-man comics. Charles' fixation upon the Treasure Island protagonist lasted for years. It manifested itself through his erratic play acting, uh, frantic uh, Robert Newton slash Long John Silver memorabilia collecting and comics making. So this chronology is somewhat fuzzy because in the documentary, uh, Robert Crum claims that the Treasure Island play acting lasted six or seven years. It's an overstatement. The available evidence suggests that Charles' obsession uh, lasted actually until 1962. It was the year when he stopped uh, making comics uh, once and for all. So the two brothers began drawing Treasure Island themed material only in 1959 in the never published single copy notebooks that they titled Notes uh, Almanac or Arcade. So you see, you see one of them here. So almost two decades before uh, Crumb's two-pager in 1978, Treasure Island Days was the title of a story by C.N.R. Crumb, Charles and Robert. Uh, this story had at least two parts. Uh, the first one was reprinted in the complete Crumb Comics, Volume 1. It was dated simply in 1959 without indication about its source. The second one appeared in a notebook, uh, Almanac 20, dated July 1, 19. Uh, 59. And uh, a third story, uh, 13 pages long, uh, The Adventures of Long John Silver, appeared in a notebook titled Arcade, undated but produced in late 1961. The three brothers, uh, so, sorry, the Crumb Brothers Treasure Island comics initially embellished on the movie's established characters. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesley, Jim were all there but the protagonist of their funnies was always Long John Silver. As time passed, two directions emerged. Uh, Robert created a non-canonical character, so 
So you see the, the, the woman in the, in the bottom right corner, Mabel, uh, a tall, busty blonde uh, who first appeared as a prostitute, then barmaid in the Treasure Island stories. She became an evident love interest of Jim Hawkins, He's a little guy uh, snuggling uh, against her. Uh, after a while, uh, Robert completely gave up drawing Treasure Island stories, but he kept Mabel and Jim in stories of his own set in the present. And so f just uh, in terms of comics history, Mabel was the very first crumb girl, the source of all the other luscious female creatures uh, that peopled his comics in the following decades. Uh, Charles, Charles' comics took a very different direction. First, he gradually developed a disturbing graphic style with omnipresent wrinkles, including in the faces of some characters. You have examples here. Uh, no, okay, I can skip uh, that. Secondly, his comics increased um, increasingly fo uh, focused increasingly on the relationship between uh, Long John Silver and Jim, uh, the rest of Stephen Sound's original cast having been evicted from the strips. Charles stopped drawing forever uh, in 1962. The rest of his life was fairly pathetic. He never left the family home, never finished college, was never able to hold a job for long, had a few very short-lived relationships that never reached the point of sexual intimacy. Following a, su a suicide attempt in the early 70s, he was diagnosed as schizophrenic and became a shut-in stabilized by neuroleptics, leaving his parents' house only for medical appointments until he took his own life in 1992 at the age of 50. So what does Charles Crumb's wretched life story have to do with Treasure Island, you may ask? Well, actually, a lot. Uh, it's Charles told me he confessed to me that when he first saw Treasure Island in 1950, he developed this crush on Bobby Driscoll and, and never went away. Bobby Driscoll is the kid who plays Jim Hawkins, and the root of this whole obsession was this kid that was in the movie. Drawing this Bobby Driscoll, this kid, you know, endlessly. And when he told me this, I was shocked. I had no idea that's what it was about. I guess it's caused him a lot of torment in his life. You know, he's never been able to have any real sexual life at all. He's never had sex. Charles discovered his homosexuality when he discovered Bobby Driscoll in Treasure Island in a theater in 1950. Actually, Charles was the only one of the three crumb boys who had seen the movie in a theater, so the, the real movie in color, before the TV airing of January 1955. Uh, by then, uh, so in 55, um, Charles had become aware of the pedophilic tendencies that attracted him to younger boys and uh, is uh, the epitome of uh, his uh, fixation was the 12-year-old Bobby Driscoll as he appeared in the Walt Disney movie. Years later, in a letter written to Robert circa 1981, Charles told him about his discovery in the Philadelphia Library in 1959 of a dictionary of motion picture actors in which he carefully copied down the list of all the movies featuring Driscoll before, I quote, frantically stuffing it into uh, my trouser pocket. He confessed, quote, at that moment, so he confessed to Robert in this, this letter, at that moment, I wanted above all to keep what I was doing a secret from others. I didn't want anyone to know that I was a homosexual pedophiliac with a hopeless crush on a little boy actor who no longer existed in the realm of reality. You probably won't answer this letter, but in case you do, remember that it will be read by mother. I would have been dreadfully ashamed and felt unspeakably guilty if anyone had found out." End of quote. Brief conclusion to this long story, Charles Crumb's fixation with Long John Silver, which was activated when his kid brother Maxon brought his makeshift crutch to his older brothers, was the tree overshadowing the forest of Charles' hidden secrets. Secret. Uh, 
a lifetime of guilt over unfulfilled homosexual pedophilic urges and schizophrenia. Its early signs were a conspicuous obsession with a fictional larger-than-life one-legged character whose disability hid a lifetime of crime, Long John Silver. This obsession itself concealed Charles' abnormal uh, libidinal urges, socially and legally unacceptable in the post-war lower middle-class America. Charles lost his fixation on Long John Silver by the early 60s, but until his suicide, he was tormented by what he himself called his sexual desire for little boys, a desire which he never acted out. As it were, to paraphrase the comics critic and historian Jit here, for Charles Graham, the youthful play that arose from the viewing of Treasure Island foreshadowed unsolvable adult tendencies towards self-destruction. Thank you. <laughs>